Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Hope for Healthcare with Dr. Katie Cole in partnership with ICD Healthcare Network. Dr. Katie Cole is a holistic physician, organizational well being consultant, and change agent, working with industry leaders and in proven strategies to heal our national healthcare system and our culture of medicine. Stay tuned to hear today's speaker. Welcome everyone to Hope for Healthcare. This is a podcast in which we interview expert leaders around the country on best practices for healing our national healthcare system, culture of medicine, and promoting optimized work environment for all employees. I want to welcome, extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Dante Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn is a CEO and managing partner of his own company, Culture Works which is dedicated to providing culture performance management solutions to help organizations measure, manage, and foster cultural change through real-time learning and practice. Dr. Vaughn is an expert in organizational leadership, workforce management, and company culture. He has over 17 years of senior level leadership experience, driving results in both the public and the private sectors fostering the design and implementation of business growth and leadership strategies throughout the US and globally. Um, he also is the co-author of the Amazon bestseller, From Culture to Culture, the system to define, implement, measure, and improve your company culture. Well, I just want to extend such a warm welcome to you, Dr. Vaughn. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I appreciate it, Dr. Cole. Thank you for having me. Yes. And, you know, we, we already had a, a little bit of discussion last week about your book and, and some things that you want to discuss today. But first, I would really like for our audience to hear how you became interested in organizational leadership and shifting our work culture. You know, my interest really started at a young age, really before I recognized how it would uh, manifest as a career uh, later on in my life. I mean, I've always been attracted to group dynamics and understanding how people come together and what what motivates them, what drives them uh, to have real uh, connection and, and impact, whether it's I'm trying to win a game or I'm trying to accomplish a task. And I didn't realize that you could actually make a career out of examining that and exploring that. I just knew that I had a gift in um coming and joining groups and, and helping navigate individuals and their capacities to, to impact one another. You know, I always joked around about myself kind of moving like Switzerland in a sense where I could roll in different groups and I had an acceptance of those groups um, and how they operated. And then it became more of a challenge of understanding key influences and and I kept that with me throughout my life. You know, I started out in the world of operations and and logistics and and um, merchandising and, and retail and kind of shifted and navigated into more operational management. And I held leadership roles and I, I had a gift in leadership. But I recognize even in academia as I navigated my um, educational journey. My real interest is in the people side of business and, and how do people come together and how do you impact that uh, experience and, and to realize a, a common goal. And that's what led me down this path of examining leadership impact. And I started to shift my studies more into organizational leadership and the principles around how leaders engage and interact and, and drive decision making in business. And that's really what what led me to um, this deeper conversation around workplace culture and and um, the impact that leaders have on workplace culture. And I share a common interest with with my business partners in, in culture work and giving leaders those tools to be effective and regardless of the industry vertical. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that, you, that you've been quoted as saying frequently is that it's not that people don't want to work. They just don't want to work for you. Can you talk more about that and what that means and how you guide your organizations? You bet. I mean, when the context of that statement is grounded in my belief that leaders have a responsibility in how they engage, interact and make decisions in business and how those actions impact the experience of others. 
And oftentimes it's easy as we look at the so-called great resignation or we look at quiet quitting and all these so-called movements that are happening. I think it's rooted in personal uh, and human experience and how have leaders perpetuated certain experiences, both in how they've claimed their culture is in the workplace versus what those individuals actually experience. Mm-hmm. And we were, when we live in a society where over 60% of, of households can earn income outside of wage and salary, that means they have options. Mm-hmm. And when you see low unemployment rates, when you see reduction in the amount of unemployment claims, yet you have all of these open positions in organizations or you have this movement around resignation and quitting, we don't point the finger or we shouldn't point the finger at the employees who have options. We should ask ourselves, have we created an environment, whether it's a healthcare environment or manufacturing environment where people want to work in our field and in our workplace? That's a, that's the bigger point of accountability, not blaming the workers, not that they don't want to work. They just don't want to work for us unless we do something about that experience. Yeah, absolutely. And like you pointed out, you know, we are in the midst of the great resignation for medicine and, you know, we're approaching possibly two thirds of the healthcare workforce exiting healthcare in the next three years, which seems like a really scary number. I don't know if that's actually accurate, but, you know, I'm really interested to know more about your thoughts on what it takes to retain and attract talent today, especially with the millennial and Gen Z generations. You bet. I mean, when you think about healthcare and you think about, you know, when we talk about this transition that's happening in the marketplace, over 55% of the working population are of a millennial or younger age. Therefore, when you think about the makeup of medical professionals, right, the inverse is the reality, right? Over 55% of the working population in the medical industry are pending retirement. So how do we offset the inevitable transition of those individuals who have worked hard and contributed to our healthcare infrastructure? How do we ensure that we equip this generation who's entering the medical field in a manner that ensures that they can carry the baton forward? So then we have to ask ourselves, well, then what have we done to both foster a culture within our medical institution that is attractive to this millennial medical professional? Mm -hmm. How have we then ensured we put systems in place so that when they join our institutions, they have a positive work experience, one that is grounded in the value system of my institution and their connection to how they then foster a positive experience for themselves, their peers, and of course, the patient population. I think we have a disconnect in how we've nurtured or um, our, our recent hires within the medical space. You know, how have we helped them navigate this Um, this role in a way that makes them say, I want to put another 20 or or 30 years. And and here's the reality. The demographic of employees today, no matter the industry vertical, isn't grounded in the same um, uh, desires surrounding their profession as maybe our Gen X or baby boomer generations were grounded in the notion of hunkering down and spending 30 years in in an institution and and, and earning and and providing for our families and, and, and also being able to serve the community. Now you have a generation who's also desired in serving the community, but doing so in a way where they feel purpose driven, they feel connected and belonging to the organization in a deeper way. They feel connected in the, in, in the roles and responsibilities they have. That means as a in medical institution, we have to shape our messaging differently if we're going to draw them to us. We're not just grounded in the oath that we take as medical professionals, but what do we do out, outside of that oath? Mm-hmm. Where What grounds us in how we engage and interact and make decisions every day? And, and, and that's the disconnect, I think, in, in how we are attempting to attract and retain 
this new generation of medical professionals. Yes, absolutely. And it goes beyond just even the messaging. I mean, you can, in healthcare, the message is, you know, we're here to serve our patients and we're here to come together in that process. But what's happening is we need more than just that message. There needs to be a sense of camaraderie and respect in a culture of, uh, in a sense of well-being at work, which I think we're really lacking in healthcare today and we're trying to work on. Um, you know, I'm curious, I know that um, you've talked, you know, actually, I'm going to skip ahead because I want to talk to you, get into your book, because I know the audience is definitely going to want to know more about this. Um, and this is an excellent book. Everyone, I, I recommend that you get a copy of this. Um, Dr. Vaughn and his business partner, Randall Powers, really outline the steps and the pillars needed to create an effective work environment outside of healthcare, inside of healthcare, in any industry. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about cultural performance management and how companies can integrate this to create more impactful leadership? You bet. I mean, the premise around cultural performance management is grounded in taking a more intentional, proactive, and operationalized approach in managing workplace culture. You know, when we talk about culture, it's always been looked at as this abstract thing and uh, you can't really manage it. It is what it is based on the people. And the, and that's frankly just not true. And we realize that being operations grounded, that culture is such an essential and critical pillar to your business. It impacts everything from like, we're talking about talent acquisition and retention to the patient experience or customer experience to, to the efficiency or, or efficacy and how we operate. It's so essential because we're bringing human beings together and we're, we're trying to mobilize those human beings to realize an outcome together, right? Mm -hmm. But yet it's not managed in, in the manner that we manage other strategic pillars of our business, right? Mm -hmm. So why? Because there hasn't been a defined system around how to define, implement, measure, and improve company culture. Well, we, what historically has existed is simply, let me try to measure the impact of leadership engagement and then react to the feedback we get from, the, from those individuals who we surveyed. Mm -hmm. And then try to generalize and then mobilize leaders around something that we haven't even investigated or understood was root cause. Or even if that's the ideal experience for our business, not just reacting to what employees or customers say they want, but also balancing that with what is required for us to realize our purpose, our vision, our mission. We said, what if we turn that on their head and got at root cause? Mm -hmm. Well, what's the root cause? What's culture? The values we share the language we use, the behaviors we dis display, the connections we make. So how do we then establish a methodology around or a system around how to actively manage culture? And that, that's where culture performance management comes in. Seven pillars. Do I have a value system? If I have a value system, have I defined them in a way in which I can align everyone in my organization and have specific behavioral expectations and standards for how they should embody those values? Mm -hmm. Have I defined them and connected them to how we operate every day? How do we help leaders become more intentional about how they show up mm -hmm. in the lives of, of, of their peers, of their patients? So my core value is, is integrity. What does integrity mean in terms of how I act and, and perform my duties every day? So that's the third pillar, define. The fourth pillar is learn. Just because I have behavioral standards or expectations that I think my leaders are supposed to come to my organization with, how do I help them learn those behaviors and, and practice them in the fifth pillar? And then measure the impact of that. That's where we get into accountability. How do we drive accountability through self-reflection, through observation? How many conversations are had being had between an, uh, a, a charge nurse and a, and a nurse or a nurse manager or an MP and an attending physician that says, hey, one of our core values is transparency. I watched you communicate with that patient. You never shared with them the fact that 
we had to change a protocol because they were not responding well. You just changed the protocol and told them you're changing the protocol, mm. right? It's subtleties in, in self-reflection and feedback that help that individual be more intentional the next time in practicing the values that connect to the and experience you're trying to create in the business. But you need that mechanism so you have measurement through reflection, through feedback, that we build tools and things that help organizations measure those things with quantitatively as well as qualitatively. And then it gives me a capacity to refine how I show up. That's intentional practice of leadership culture in a business, not waiting for a reactionary result of a survey to tell me I'm not showing up a certain way, right? And in that the way I'm showing up may or may not be in alignment with what you need from me in the first place anyway. So oh, right. that's in a nutshell, cultural performance management. Wow, that that was a great overview. And, you know, one of the one of the and I don't remember which section of the book it's in, but you you actually go into detail where you say that some leaders of organizations, you know, they have their guiding, they have like their values and mission statement, right? And their top leaders in the C-suite, whatever, but they practice those but then they leave it up to each department leader or manager to manage the i don't know what you call it but the the after the effects of the um guiding principles so each department within an organization could be showing up differently with the values and could be could be behaving differently based on their own managers interpretations of the values and i just wanted to talk with you a little bit about that because I, I see that happening in healthcare, you know, and, and so I really want to dive deep into this subject with you for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the premise, you know, I, in most organizations, frankly, because of this movement around, you know, being more conscious of what grounds an organization in their actions, you know, most companies have some form of values or beliefs that they were that were meant to be guiding principles. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge with that is they only took a surface level approach in de in declaring what those values are. And in many cases, I mean, you can blow the dust off of the picture frames in the conference room relative to them. Most can't even recite them. Um, or they treated it like a campaign and not really an expectation for performance, which means those values weren't defined in a way that made them actionable and have become a standard by which everyone is measured in their performance. We measure output departmentally. We measure uh, um, the you know uh, efficacy of our treatments. We measure the impact that um, our um, staff is having on um, you know, patient care from uh, an intake and outtake uh, um, output perspective, but are we measuring behaviorally how people are engaging and interacting and what's driving their decision making? Well, that's typically not integrated into that evaluation process in a real intentional way, all the way back from core values and principles and belief statements, all the way to if you don't show up this way, then you're not meeting fully our expectations and let's give you tools and resources to help you show up this way. Like that, most organizations haven't gotten that far. So what happens is, yeah, you, you have a general value system that people kind of treat in the manner that the organization presents it. It's, it's almost window dressing or if it's not window dressing, it's just we haven't integrated it into our business. We put a lot of communication around it, but not a lot of integration in terms of our other areas of our business? Have you articulated it in the job description? Have you developed interview protocols that ensure you're asking the right questions to validate that they can align with that belief system? Have you integrated it into how people show up and engage and interact every day? Have you integrated it into your performance review process? Have you entered it into your bonus uh, system? Mm -hmm. Right, that's where it's missing. So what happens? We're still, we're trying to do the best we can in our interpretation of what that means. Cause we don't, we don't know how to make what the company defined arbitrarily is and, and make that actionable. So we're going to form our own way of how we show up that way. Now you take it and every leader is going to apply their understanding because there's a lack of specificity and clarity around well, what does it mean? And a lot of organizations, 
sometimes these core values or beliefs are so broad and abstract. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, we bleed blue. I, <laughs> Um, we do what it, whatever it takes. Oh right? no! Like, Whoa! <laughs> what do you mean? Do whatever it takes. So in my department, do whatever it takes may mean by any means necessary. <laughs> right? So uh, you know, this is this oh, is God. part of the, the disconnect, right? And it if I'm not being true. held to that, if I'm only being held to the output, yeah, you know, then then it it, it becomes less of a area that I put a lot of emphasis around my learning, my practice, my development. Mm -hmm. So how do you work with organizations to weave their guiding principles and values throughout the fabric of their system? How do, how do you do that? You know, it starts with first, let's revisit those values and, and principles and mm -hmm. not in the context, you know, of whether they're good or bad. We don't have any ideological view on what you believe your value should be. What we do is we try to have the senior most leaders in an organization reflect on the drivers of success in their business. And this is one of the tips we give in the book is if you want to start somewhere, just reflect on what has led to your success, okay. not transactionally, not in your systems or your processes, in the behaviors that people have embodied and practiced every day that you believe contribute to your success. Write that down and ask yourself, Good. Does the value system you have in place connect to what is actually happening in your business that drives your success? Because you have some refinement to do. Mm -hmm. That also helps you start to clarify when we say a core value is excellence, what we mean is this, 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 and this, because it contributes to our success. Not because the market told us is important, but because we see it show up in our business every day. Mm -hmm. The same thing applies to what you believe is missing in how people are engaging and interacting that could further your success. So when you define behaviorally what you want and work backwards, sometimes you get better refinement of the values and we help them through that process. And, and, and through that, we also help them remove ambiguity around what it really means. Mm. Because a lot of times these, these values are either antiquated and are, so you fail to connect to the leaders in your organization or members of your organization and to the marketplace. So a lot of times it requires refinement for that purpose, but then it also requires refinement because it doesn't, it lacks definition in terms of action. So once you define that and understand the actions, now you have to look at these areas of integration, communication and integration, you know, what's required for you to, to actually start to, hold people accountable to showing up that way and that's where we start to get into well then where is culture fostered in your business points of engagement interaction and connection let's map those out let's talk about it through the lens of patient experience from initial from initial registration and intake all the way to treatment post-treatment and 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 exit what is the experience we're trying to foster for that patient where are those points of engagement, interaction, and decision making? And then how, and let's map those out because those could be opportune times to be really intentional about perpetuating this culture we claim exists in our business. Let's start there. Because what happens is inherently through social learning theory, through experiential learning, then those moments that are less transactional, you still start to foster that relate the, the that that engagement and that experience that you want because it starts to become ingrained in how you move and how you operate every day but we start with the more systematic or standard points of engagement or what we call cultural connection as a means of bringing consciousness and awareness for practitioners and leaders in business to start to say okay i have this this patient experience or this culture path for the patient. I have this culture path for new hires. I have this culture path for existing staff. Mm -hmm. How do we become intentional about practicing these very, the, these behaviors that we've been really specific in defining as a standard and expectation for performance? Start there. That'll at least get you going in this more systematized approach. And then we can get into what are the tools you have in place for fostering better learning, practice, refinement, what are the measurements? And, and like I said, we build tools and, and it's, that help 
leaders with new technology to kind of implement a lot of what I'm talking about. But cultural performance management as a methodology requires these systematic approaches to navigating or mobilizing people around around the culture. So Dr. Vaughn, how does this impact return on investment for companies when they invest in their culture and really um, standardize their values and their guiding principles throughout the system? How does that equate to profitability for the organization and in, in, in what ways? I'm curious. Great question. And, and this comes up a lot, especially in organizations that, you know, most organizations, right? We're not doing this necessarily for, for free, right? I mean, our objective is to drive profitability so that we can continue to realize our, our purpose, our, our mission, our, our vision, right? And, and when you think about this enhanced alignment around how leaders should engage and interact and how it influences decisions, if you've done the work, of validating the importance of these behaviors and outcomes in the business, then you start to bridge the correlation between practice and outcomes. Mm -hmm. And we see it manifest mm -hmm. in the form of, let's just talk about greater retention. The cost associated with turnover alone in an organization is, is astronomical, especially depending on industry vertical. The cost to source, screen, hire, train, and, and optimize an individual's performance just to lose them as a result of the lack of fostering the experience that we claim when we hire them. Imagine the savings associated with perpetuating that culture. So that in and of itself in a reduction in turnover. Think about productivity. Mm -hmm. The efficiencies gained in creating capacity of your leaders and employees and how they operate every day. If, if y'all hear crying, it's my son. Um, <laughs> uh, imagine the capacity created when you are engaging in a way that drives better alignment and performance expectations when driving greater motivation, greater intentionality in how everyone's operating, a sense of purpose in how they're operating, a connection to what they do and how it helps them realize the greater mission, vision. Mm -hmm. That creates capacity that translates into dollars for an organization, both in patient capacity, their ability to navigate patient care in a way that now they can manage census because now they are efficient and effective in that patient experience, right? They're minimizing the repetition uh, that's associated with uh, because of a lack of communication, because of a lack of awareness and, and expectations. I mean, there's so many things that are realized simply by being more intentional and systematic and how they are driving engagement, interaction, and decision-making in the business. Even down to critical decisions that are made in and throughout the uh, um, organization, what's the barometer for how you're driving that decision-making? And sometimes it's going to be grounded in the core values and principles of, of that organization because it isn't written in a policy book. And how do we ensure that that decision making aligns accordingly because those decisions have fiduciary impact on a business. Mm -hmm. It could lead to litigation. It could lead to a number of things, excess waste or costs associated with this decision making. So how are we grounding us? What's grounding us? Right. So all of these things have an impact simply by formalizing or articulating that cultural performance management system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that was very well explained, Dr. Vaughn. I appreciate your perspective on that. And, Thank you. you know, we have we have the data showing that even in healthcare investing, you, even just starting with the patient experience and, you know, looking at, you know, the patient feedback on on how their clinician team is doing and, and those scores relate to profitability. So when they improve, profitability improves. So, um, but, you know, there is no one way. Uh, to get, you know, to improve a company culture. And so, you know, in healthcare, we're excited to talk to other industry leaders and experts like yourself, um, because you've been so successful in implementing these strategies in other organizations. And, you know, we want to learn from what, what's working. 
Well, you know, Dr. Vaughn, you know, I really appreciate your perspective on all of this. And, you know, in healthcare, you know, we are really looking outside of the industry to see what's working because, you know, I, I think I was talking with another person today about that we might even be 40 to 50 years behind, you know, other industries in America and globally on company culture and workplace environment. And so we want to learn from the best. And so I'm really excited to be able to have you here today. Um, there is no one way to improve company culture. And so your perspective is very valuable since you've been doing this for decades. No, I appreciate that. And, and you know, I'll say that where we've landed in this journey of improving employee, you know, customer patient experiences, we have to remain true to root cause and the real impact that we all have, starting with leaders and fostering this experience that we all desire. And unless and until we can operate from a place of truth and authenticity around what we're doing to contribute to those experiences, we're never truly going to realize the the, the the vision that we have. And and so for us, our our approach is about how do we get at the leadership impact on this workplace culture and how do we equip leaders with the tools and resources to help them better perpetuate or foster this culture that 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 we envision. So so that's the work that we do because we believe that we can help people lead better together mm -hmm. and, and we can do so effectively and with real tangible impact. Well, and we know that leadership is local. So, and I think, was it you or somebody else that said that 80% of people worldwide would actually fire their immediate manager or boss? <laughs> So it's a real thing. I mean, we're really, and we know that physician burnout is directly linked to um, the manager or physician leader above us. So it's really important that we address the idea of leadership training and leadership evolution with the times. And then the assessment and accountability piece is key. Uh, agreed 100%. I mean, oftentimes, especially in, in industries that are grounded in such a specialized technical, you know, nuance that still involves a tactical aspect of it. But, you know, when you think about healthcare and and the channels by which professionals navigate to, to realize leadership roles, what's missed in that is greater investment in leadership training and development and helping them connect how they show up, how they engage, how they interact. What drives their decision making isn't just grounded in the technical understanding, but also in the human understanding mm -hmm. and in how to impact and motivate and inspire and educate, right? The role in, uh, of a leader. So, th so the expectations have to shift. The measure of performance has to shift. And until that happens, then the barometer is off. Therefore, the experience is often misaligned with what you want. Well, the realignment with the guiding principles and the values, I think, is definitely key. And I know in healthcare, that's <clears throat> where we need to start, at least. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, any way I can help in that journey or in, in mission, I'm, I'm all for it. That's what I'm here for. And that's what Culture Works here for. Yeah. So what's the best way for everyone to reach out to you if they have any questions or they want to talk with you? Sure. I mean, if you can visit us at Get Culture Works, that's works with an X. So Get Culture works w o r x dot com you can also contact us on any major social media platform you can find us on facebook on twitter um uh, instagram i mean it, we're trying to remain as as present with the times and outreach and connection as possible mm -hmm. um and and there we can get in touch and have a conversation i'm also on linkedin uh, you know, as an opportunity to to further the conversation around culture performance management and how to enhance this culture experience for everyone. Mm. Well, thank you, Dr. Vaughn. It's been a pleasure having you here today. And for our audience, you know, we will definitely be posting online on social media. Dr. Vaughn will have his own bio page on my website as well. And with the links to the book, if you're interested in purchasing that, which I recommend that you do. So. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Vaughn. Thank you, Dr. Cole. Appreciate you. <laughs>